All right, healthcare professionals. So healthcare industry, huge industry, right? Mm -hmm. This is why you guys are here, because you're like, oh, there's lots of demand in healthcare, I'll be able to get a job, right? So this is why you're here, this is why you're in school. Um, in 08, there were over 14.3 million jobs in healthcare. It's a lot of jobs, right? So uh, registered nurses, 2.6 million, physicians, 661,000, physician assistants, 78 or 74,000, um, and goes on and goes on. We're gonna start talking about physicians first. They're pretty important, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, pre-medical students can basically get a degree in any subject, undergrad. So you may have somebody majoring in fine arts or English or whatever you had. Um, now there are some prerequisite classes they have to take, like biology, chemistry, physics. Um, and obviously getting into med medical school is not always easy. It's pretty competitive. Um, they have to take the MCAT test and pass that to be able to get accepted into a medical school. So basically they do four years undergraduate, um, do the MCAT, and then they can get into medical school and they go to medical school and then end up having to do a residency. Um, a residency can vary. It depends on what type of uh, physician you want to be. So uh, I had a friend that just finished her residency in family medicine. She wants to be a family practice physician. And the length of resident, residency can vary depending on what type of physician you want to be. So uh, neurosurgery residency will probably be longer than one for family practice. It's a little bit more complex. Um, once a physician finishes their residency, then they're able to take the board certification um, and get go through the whole process of licensing and, and being able to start practicing. Residency work hours. At one point in time, residents would just work and work and work and work and work a whole lot of hours. And you know, hospitals love this because they were getting a lot of value out of these, these students who were just working. Well, they changed the rules a little bit. So now um, they can't work more than 80 hours a week, which still sounds like a lot, but just imagine if they're limited to 80 hours now, how many they were working before that. Why do you think they may have uh, established this rule or this law? Or exhaustion. Exhaustion, mm -hmm. mistakes, time, error, right. Um, all the things you said are correct. So, so thankfully, we should be thankful that now they, they have this, this in place. Um, what this meant was that because the hours of residencies went down, that they had to go back to using more physicians to fill in those time slots. Um, <clears throat> so, licensing. Most physicians can get a license to practice after they have gone through all of their post-grad training and all that stuff. Obviously licenses are based on state, so hopefully your doctors here all have North Carolina licenses. I have seen situations where doctors are practicing in certain states and don't have a license there and may have a license somewhere else and they kind of just went under the radar and you know as consultants we get hired to come and investigate those types of things. So I have found doctors that weren't licensed, or maybe their license expired and they didn't renew it. I have a question. Yeah. If there's the board certifications, when they take go and take their boards, is it like a different board certification for family practice versus neuro? Right. There's different yeah. tests that they and, complete. And, the, and they have to be recertified every so often as okay. well. So you may have, again, it's the same thing. Um, you may have a physician practicing that has not been recertified not probably what you want. You want to make sure you have a physician that is current on their certifications, because that's important. That means that they are knowledgeable and have been kept abreast on changes and things that are going on in their field. So your physician that you see should be licensed and should be certified. And these are all things you can check online. There are certain websites that post information where you can just research to make sure your doctor is squared away. Can't they like withdraw them their medical malpractice if they're not certified like they're supposed to be? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
criminal background checks. Also very important. Why do you think? They don't want to hire a sex offender or somebody to, uh, to work with a doctor. Right. You want to make sure that your physician is not abusing drugs or yeah. people or, you know, like you said, child molester. So criminal, criminal background checks are also done, you know, in conjunction with licensing, certification, and all that stuff. Um, when a hospital goes to, to bring on a physician or onto their staff, they should be doing these as well. Because again, you want to make sure that your physician is, is clean and squared away. I've seen hospitals that had no idea about the history of the physicians working at the hospital is because no one did this. <coughs> or they did this and, you know, for whatever reason, or, you know, went under the radar or what have you. So, very important. And you have to remember, especially with regard to drugs, physicians have easy access to this. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're, you're doing adequate checks on them. Um, we already kind of talked about board certification. Uh, basically what happens is there's different boards depending on your specialty. And after they've completed all the exams, then the physician is designated as a board certified whatever in their whatever specialty they have. Some uh, physicians are board certified in more than one specialty. You'll have some physicians that are board certified in general surgery as well as family practice or they can be um, board certified in whatever they want really as long as they uh, satisfy all the requirements. So obviously the more <coughs> um, certifications a physician has, they're probably more skilled in most cases. <coughs> um, not only do hospitals check on these things, but also insurance companies want to check also to make sure that they're <coughs> board certified. Why do you think that's the case? <coughs> to make sure their money's getting man it paid. In the right no. places. What yeah. else? They'll be like, oh, for, I don't know. It's just like your, You're your, on the right your car insurance. If you don't have a driver's license, then you can't, you can't have car insurance, kind of. I want to go back to what you were saying, because you're on the right path. They'll be held liable, but I don't know. <coughs> if an HMO or insurance company has a physician on their panel, and they haven't done the checks to make sure that they're legit. Oh, it's gonna fall back on the HMO. Because they didn't follow suit or investigate it properly. Exactly. Sorry. So, that's why it says hospitals, HMOs, and other healthcare organizations all need to be researching this information to make sure the doctor's legit. Um, continuing med medical education, as we were talking about, physicians have to be, um, they can't just pass all this stuff and just practice for the rest of their lives. They also have to do conti continuing med medical education every two to three years to make sure that their license is kept up to date. Um, a lot of hospitals will require physicians to remain on their panel to have CME credits. Um, physician credentialing, does anybody know what that is? It's basically the process that the hospital goes through to check all of these things. So, if you're a physician and I'm the hospital and you want to come work in my hospital, it's like an application process that you have to do and you have to submit all this paperwork to me. I have to go through all the paperwork to make sure that you're legit. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the credentialing process. It can take a pretty long time. Um, most hospitals will have a credentialing department that handles all this stuff, but until the credentialing process is done, the physician can't practice at a hospital. Um, so it's kind of a waiting period. Mm -hmm. Um, that the physician has to go through until he's been credentialed and then he can practice at a hospital. 
If there's a physician practicing at a hospital and they haven't been credentialed, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be there. Um, as we kind of just talked about, when they do these searches, it needs to be done diligently. I've seen so many times where the credentialing process was not done right, um, criminal charges, all kinds of things were not red flagged, and you have this, you know, unlicensed position working at your hospital. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of times when when that comes out, the first department they're going to go to is the credentialing department and say, "Why did you catch this?" Because that's their purpose is to make sure that every physician practicing at the hospital is legit. I was gonna ask you, so like when they fly in a specialist or something, they already have, they are, he's, he or she is already connected with that particular hospital or how you say work? fly in. They don't listen to much TV, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Possibly. <laughs> okay. But, but to answer your question, if you're going into a hospital and a doctor is there and you're seeing them, they've been credentialed. Or they should have been credentialed. Um, a random physician just can't walk off No, no, the no. Street. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. like they say, well, we know this physician, he's very, he's, this is his specialty, but he's not here. We can bring him in, da da da, da. Yeah. That type of thing. If that's the case, then he's, he he's always still has to be credentialed. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's why sometimes, you have to go to that hospital to see that physician okay. because that's probably the case. He's not credentialed here, but he's credentialed at okay. that hospital, and so that's why sometimes patients will get transported to a certain hospital or help you know um, mm -hmm. helicopter taken to another hospital, and it's because okay. they only they can only work where they're credentialed. Okay. But what about the, um? Did you hear about the incident that happened like recently at Cape Fear, where the guy was posing as a doctor on the um? I don't know if it was the I heard briefly about it, and, and again, it goes back to this. So they, they were liable even though they didn't know that he was walking, like, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, because that means somebody in the credentialing department didn't do their job. So more than likely, they, they probably got fired or definitely reprimanded because something, something fell through the cracks. And, and this is the department that's <coughs> responsible for, that's their sole mission, is to make sure that everybody in the hospital is legit. Um, so what's your role as a manager, a healthcare manager? Well, you have to work closely with the credentialing department and physician relations to make sure that the physician, especially if you're managing a certain department, if you're uh, managing the um, MRI or, or imaging department, you want to make sure that all the radiologists in your department are legit. And so from time to time, you'll, you'll be in conversations with the credentialing department, physician relations department, just to make sure everything's um, you know, on point and together. Um, gaps in resumes. Well, we know for a regular resume, gaps in resumes aren't good, right? Mm -hmm. So same thing applies for a physician. Most physicians are, you know, <coughs> documented from the time they graduate up until, you know, going through medical school, first jobs. So if there's gaps, and again, going back to your question, I don't know if this guy had a resume that he submitted, but if there were gaps or red flags on his resumes, it should have been caught um, for, for the Cape Fear example that you provided. Um, as it says, physicians rarely take time off to find themselves. So if you see a, ga a huge gap on the resume, it's something you may want to look into further. Um, because again, you know, the credentialing department and, and anybody who has access to that information, if something were to go wrong and they come back and say, well, why didn't you speak up about it? You could be held liable. Physician imposters. We just talked about that. It happens more than you think. You'll have people posing as um, physicians when they're really not physicians, or they'll have fraudulent credentials saying they went to Harvard and they went to some school in Barbados. Um, so you have to be very careful when you go through your searches um, and the credentialing process. Um, yeah, we'll keep going. Um, 
there's a database created to document physicians who partake in non-professional behavior. And it's called the National Practitioner Database. And basically, it's a huge kind of um, database that you can go and see everybody who's, and there's several different ones. You can see everybody who's you know, done anything wrong. Um, and again, this is something that credentials department will use when they're doing their research uh, to do checks on, on the physicians. Um, so back to the credentialing process. After they've done all the checks, then the, ma the materials are submitted to a committee and eventually they'll end up in the board meeting. And so even after the credentialing department has done their checks, before the physician can practice at the hospital, they still have to be approved by board, the board. Um, and typically, during each board meeting, in my experiences, there were always a couple of physicians that were brought to the table that they had to approve. Um, so what that means is, even if the credentialing department goes through, chasing the physician, they're legit, they submit it to the board, if the board says no, then that's it. They can't practice at the hospital. Um, so the entire process can take three to four months, maybe longer if something's wrong. Um, um, so international medical graduates, the number of these um, students are increasing, and these are students who um, may be foreign born or, or immigrants to the U.S., but I want to stop and talk about this group and why you think they may be important. Like the Patels, the M, yeah. Okay, <laughs> because you have a lot of them, mm -hmm. and they specialize in different, um, different part of the health industry, but um, they're very good, I mean, they're very thorough. They're yeah. training, oh, well, I can say they're training, I don't know about the training, but I'm just saying they're highly recommended Okay, what um, else? Do they get training that the U.S. doesn't or no, they not don't necessarily. Say not necessary? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, in a lot of cases, they fill a need in areas that other people won't go, <laughs> meaning a lot of rural areas mm -hmm. where no one else necessarily wants to live you'll find that a lot of the international medical graduates end up working in these areas. And so they're fulfilling a need or a, a gap or a physician demand where, you know, U.S. physicians may not want to live, they're willing to go. So they're very important to society and to the healthcare industry because they're helping to, to create better access to care for, for patients. Um, and here it talks about you know, they provide services where U.S. medical graduates won't go. Um, obviously, they have to pass English language skill tests to make sure that they can thoroughly communicate with their patients. Um, and as we're just talking about, um, the workforce numbers are changing, and they're expected that the shortage of positions is going to increase. Do you have any guesses as to why that might be the case? Um, is it about the money? Well, <coughs> is it money? Money. That's one reason. Is it, <coughs> is it, <coughs> is it going to be because, like, the physicians we mainly have now are older? Exactly. It's so older workforce, so a lot of them are starting to retire. Um, being a physician, <coughs> physician is very demanding, and people of uh, um, younger generations want that balance, work-life balance, a little bit more than the older physicians are. And so you're finding that less people are, you know, moving into going to medical school because they realize how rigorous it is, in addition to money. Physicians making less because you know uninsured and Medicaid and Medicare is increasing. So all those things kind of factor into the workforce 
but it presents a problem because the shortage is going to grow as the years um, go on. Another thing that's changing is physicians are moving to become, um, going back to the hospitals and becoming um, employees of the hospitals rather than having their own private practice. Kind of the same reasons they can't necessarily afford to run their practice as they were before, but why might that not be a good thing? And we kind of just talked about it. The more that they close their practices down and go back to hospitals, again, it's going to create an access problem because people are going to have um, less access to care. Or they may have to drive farther or, or you know, wherever or go to Raleigh instead of you know, wherever to get care. So it's not a good thing that um, you know, more physicians are necessarily becoming employed in hospitals and closing down their businesses because you're gonna have people that may not be able to drive that extra five miles to get to wherever doctor, um, if the doctor there in their town closes, closes their doors. Now sometimes um, people present enticing gifts and compensation to doctors for different things. Obviously this is not something that should be done, um, and they're creating laws to try to combat this because what was happening was, it, and it was happening a lot in the pharmaceutical area, you have these pharmaceutical reps that were taking these doctors out, taking them on trips, mm -hmm. and in exchange for them to write prescriptions, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like I scratch your back, you scratch mm -hmm. mine, um, it's an obvious conflict of interest. It's not something they're supposed to be doing that's against the laws. And so um, the government has tried to tighten up the laws on that. And so you don't see it as much, but it's something that does still happen. Um, so we talked about physicians that are, are leaving or quitting. And so how can we keep them? How can we retain them? We can offer them different types of employment, right? So we may say, well, before you quit altogether, what do you think about working part-time or working three days a week instead of five, right? Mm -hmm. Or giving them a flexible work schedule. Um, I've seen some hospitals um, offer less call. So say, instead of being on call every weekend, we'll just make you on call one weekend a month. So there's different strategies you can use to try to keep physicians, but Hospitals are going to have to try to do whatever they can to keep them to make sure that they have enough physicians to see all the patients that will be coming in, and we all know that more patients will be coming in. Why? Because of Obamacare, right? And more patients will be coming in to get care because of the changes in, in the government. So we need physicians. We can't see the patients if we don't have doctors, right? Um, so burnout, obviously we just talked about physicians um, and it being a rigorous job. A lot of them do get burned out. A lot of them get tired. They work, they work a lot of hours a week. They're on call. Um, it's a very busy, intense um, job to have. So it's important that we make sure that there's some job satisfaction there as much as possible. Physicians have a lot of clout in their organization. So if they're not happy, then more than likely, no one else is going to be happy either because they're going to make sure that everybody knows they're not happy. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about nurses now. Does anybody have a family member that's a nurse? Or, you know, <coughs> you know? Okay. Um, nurses are also very important. Um, and typically what happens with nursing, you know, we have a nursing program here. So you can come through a nursing program at a community college or you can do a four year uh, BSN degree. So there's different options um, as to how you can become a nurse. Um, 
I've heard that the, the BSN program is pretty rigorous. Um, they also have to do a certain number of sciences and those types of courses. And um, I'm hoping that more students will go into nursing because again, as patient numbers go up, not only will we need physicians, but we'll also need nurses also. Um, for the most part, nursing school is kind of kind of hard to get in. It's pretty competitive also. I've known people that have been on waiting lists just to get into nursing school for even a year, as long as a year, just to get in. Um, so it's pretty pretty intense also. For a nurse to obtain their, their license, they have to take the National Council Licensure Examination. So once they pass that, then they can get their license, kind of similar to what the physicians have to go through. Um, nursing turnover, it's high or low? <coughs> Say hi. Why? It's 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 a pretty intense job as well because they have to deal directly with the patients and they have to deal with physicians. Mm -hmm. So it can be a very stressful job. Um, all the reasons you mentioned are, are also reasons why you know with relocations and things like that. Um, but as a result, this can cost a hospital a lot of money when the turnover is high because they're having to hire new nurses or hire temporary staff and, and temp staffing can be very expensive. Um, so it's important that you really focus on retention of nurses and making sure that they're satisfied and their morale is high because um, the downside to that of having to replace them can be pretty costly. Um, now just like the physicians have certain standards, there's also certain standards for nurses um, that they have to abide by, they have to have, um, you know, certain policies and as a nurse, certain rules that they need to abide by with the patients. And the CCNE is just one of those standards that they have to, to abide by. Um, as you just talked about, why nurses leave, they often feel overworked, underpaid, um, disrespected. Like I said, you know, working with physicians can be difficult. Um, Increases in daily workloads. Patients are sicker now, which means nurses are working harder um, and working longer to make sure that their needs are met. Um, we need to make sure that the nurses aren't overworked because as we talked about, it might present issues with medical errors, and mistakes, um, deaths, unfortunately. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have a good patient to nurse ratio. Do you guys know what that is? It's basically the number of patients each nurse sees. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have one nurse that is taking care of like 15 patients, because that would be a lot, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what floor they're on, it's also gonna um, affect the ratio. So uh, a nurse in ICU is gonna have a much smaller ratio than a nurse on a regular med, med surge floor. Um, keep going. Does anybody know what a sentinel event is? Guess not. It's an event that um, results in death. This is not a good thing. Um, and a lot of times, obviously, these have to be documented somewhere um, every time they occur. The hospital has to document that, and um, it's something that is out of it when they get visits and things like that. So, um, and typically, you know, we just talked about board meetings. This type of stuff is also reported in the board meetings as well. Um, let's see, get past nursing. Um, Certification for nurses is kind of the same way as we talked about with physicians. You can be certified as a cardiac nurse or ICU nurse, surgical nurse, or whatever it may be. Um, 
and they kind of they have to renew their certification, similar to physicians as well. They also have to do continuing education, just like physicians, um, to maintain their license as well. Um, LPNs. Everybody know what an LPN is? Um, they work under physicians and nurses. Very critical or very important to you know healthcare organizations um, because they do a lot of things that allow nurses and physicians to be more productive. So they do things like you know checking the vitals, and observing patients, helping them move around in the bed, and, and turning patients and stuff like that. And that allows for nurses. And, and physicians to do other things to keep them more productive so that everybody is being efficient. So is that fading out, that program is fading out and medical assistant is more taking their place? Um, I don't know about, I wouldn't say it's necessarily fading out because they're kind of two different things. Mm -hmm. I see an LPN as more complex than a medical assistant. Like the registered medical assistant, is that not the same as? No, okay. it's too different. I, I, I okay. see the LPN as more clinical. Like they're able to do right. more clinical things. Okay. Kind of a step up from a medical okay. assistant. What okay. about the CNAs? That's underneath the LPN. Yeah, yeah. yeah. CNA above a, a, a medical assistant. Oh, really? Okay. In my mind, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to get to those. Um, here we are. CNAs. Um, CNAs are also very important because, again, they do a lot of um, other things that nurses and, and they're the maids. And, <laughs> they're the maids. 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 CNA is a help. Um, <laughs> um, they're important, though. We yeah. need them. We need CNAs, yeah. and I and I, you know, from working in a hospital and talking to CNAs, I, I can feel that they sometimes get a little disgruntled because they they do kind of feel like they're the maids, um, but they're very important because they do things as as small as answering call bells. You know what I mean? And but that's something important because if they don't do, who's gonna do it? Somebody has to do it. Um, and so you know, I do think that sometimes CNAs tend to be a little disgruntled, and they probably. Um, aren't appreciated as much as they should be, but they're very vital to, to the chain. Um, turnover for CNAs can be pretty high because of what we're, we're talking about right now. And again, can cost a lot of money, not as much as nurses, because obviously nurses get paid more, but, but any turnover is gonna cost the organization some money in the long run. Um, home health growth. It's something that's going to continue to grow because people are living longer and people are wanting to live at home more than going to a nursing facility. Um, and so we're talking about this because the positions that we just talked about are going to be more in demand for this industry as well, for the home health industry. Um, so you have home health aides that are kind of similar to um, you know, some of these are nurses, some of these are LPNs. It kind of depends on the tasks that are needed for that particular patient in the home health. Um, now we have mid-level practitioners. These are your PAs, nurse practitioners. So these are people that aren't physicians, but they are a little bit more advanced than a nurse. Um, for these types of positions, typically you do four years of undergrad and then you um, do whatever the extra years are for this specific position. So for like PAs, for most PAs, it's two years um, after your undergraduate. If you're a specialized PA, like a um, neurosurgical PA or something, you may have to do three years. But it's still less time than uh, medical school. Um, PAs and nurse practitioners can practically do almost everything that a physician can do. Um, they can write scripts. However, um, they still have to have a physician that oversees mm -hmm. them. Isn't that field growing? Yeah. That's what my friend went to school for. Yeah. And they're, they're building, um, well, they have a PA program at Methodist, mm -hmm. and then Campbell is in the process of building. Um, 
as well. So even here, there's growth. So that tells you that that area is growing. Um, um, this, this level of practitioners, they pretty much work everywhere. ED, physician offices, hospitals, uh, surgery department. So they're also very important to, to healthcare. And what it allows is for, you know, we talked about this in one of my other classes, if um, a physician, you know, is able to hire two PAs, they can be more efficient than if they hire two more doctors. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna save them money because they're not gonna make as much as a hiring a doctor. Um, talked about nurse practitioners. Um, most of these have completed a master's program or MSN program. I have a friend that just finished last year um, with her MSN program, so now she's a nurse practitioner. Um, they can also become certified in specific areas. Um, and again, they have to pass exams to, to, to um, become a nurse practitioner and also have to be recertified. In some states, um, they allow nurse practitioners to practice independently. Not all states are there yet. Um, and so, but they're saying that because the physician shortage is expected to increase, that more states may open up and allow nurse practitioners to practice independently. Um, CRNAs, these are certified registered nurse anesthetists, basically, it's almost equivalent to a nurse practitioner, but specifically um, related to anesthesia. So sometimes when you go in and you have surgery, you may see a CRNA in there along with the anesthesiologist. Um, they have to have a BSN, and they before they get here, they have to have worked as an RN for at least a year. Um, these are very important people because if you're having procedures done, you most likely need anesthesia. They make very good money too, by the way. Um, midwives. This is something, an area where it's growing. There's a, a lot more people going in to become midwives and um, they're licensed as independent practitioners in all 50 states. They have to be nurses. Um, with at least one to two years of nursing experience. They have to graduate from a midwife program. And so they have to go, you know, these aren't just people that just walk off the street. They have to go through a lot of testing and accreditation just like other nurses do as well. Um, over 80% have master's degrees. 7% um, have doctoral degrees. PAs, physician assistants, um, in 08, there are almost 75,000 employed in the U.S. Um, there's all different types of programs um, that you can do as a PA. Again, you have to take a test and you have to do continuing education credits every two years. Um, as I said, they're definitely valuable members of the healthcare team. And a lot of doctors like having PAs and nurse practitioners in their office because they, they again, help them to be more efficient and um, you know, in the long run, they're saving them money because of the cost of hiring them versus somebody else. Um, so there's more than 2,000 programs um, offered for allied healthcare professionals. And, um, you know, obviously they assist physicians and nurses in providing care. Um, and I think this number is going to grow as the demand for healthcare services grows. I think more uh, people will go into allied health as well. Um, I can't remember who it was in here, but someone asked about um, exactly what is an allied health professional. Does anybody know? One's on the board. Oh, basically all the assistants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all collectively. Yeah. Therapists, um, mm -hmm. techs, all types of imaging techs. Mm -hmm. Um, are all in that category. Um, and that's it. Anybody have any questions? We went kind of fast, so. You know, if, if you take nothing else from this lecture today, 
take away the fact that the demand for services is going to grow, which will obviously mean the demand for people working in the industry is going to grow. Um, and as we saw, every, at every level, everybody is in court because they're playing a part in providing care to the patient. So, um, so more the responsibility of providing health care is going to go to the lower level I as think opposed so. to where it's at right now. I think so. I think so. And, and part of that is because as you know, everybody switches to EMR, there's just going to be more stuff to do. So, you know, if a CNA or an LPN can go help a patient while the nurse is documenting, then it's going to make everything easier. And then so all the hospitals will be built into it. Right. So do the nurse, the nurse in it, is it the nursing assistants? The, I don't know, the one, the one next to the um, physician's assistants, the nurse, whatever that's called. Nurse practitioner. Nurse, nurse practitioner. Does, is, when they work alone, independently, do they also have to have some kind of malpractice insurance? Yeah. They do? Yeah. They offer that for? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They would have to, you know? I thought it was only offered for 